Oh, hello everyone, uh, I'm James McCardle, the Community Manager here at Protexia, and welcome to this installment of the Protexia IP Matters webinar series on patents and patent types. Thanks for coming. Um, a few administrative notes before we get started. We'll be taking questions during the webinar via Twitter, and we'll address them at the end. Uh, if you have any questions, just tweet them to hashtag patent types with two Ts, or at Protexia. We'll be monitoring that feed, and then we'll get to them after the webinar. So we're going to be using an example patent in this webinar. It's US 6787928. Uh, if you want to follow along, you can download the patent from our site. There should be a link on the webinar page just below. Uh, we're going to record the webinar. People often ask about this. Um, so we'll record the webinar, and after the webinar is over, I will email you the slides and the recording so you can uh, have it for your reference. Uh, and lastly, don't forget that you can see the full list of past and upcoming webinars on the IP Matters page. And uh, that page is www.patexia.com slash ipmatters.html. Okay, so that's all the major stuff out of the way. So let me take a minute to introduce Daniel Porter. Um, Daniel is the case research manager here at Patexia. He has a degree in physics from Cornell University and is a published research author in fluid dynamics. He'll be talking today uh, about the different Parts and patent uh, parts and types of patents and patent applications. Um, so I'm going to pass the webinar to him and uh, hide myself. Uh, and so, without further ado, uh, here's Daniel. Thanks a lot, James. Um, as he mentioned, uh, my name is Daniel Porter. I'm the case research manager here at Patexia. Welcome everybody to the webinar today. I'm going to be talking about patent types, um, application types, and contents of patents and patent applications. Um, the talk is really intended for people who don't really come from a legal background. I myself am more from a, a research or a technical background, so I, I'm sort of more comfortable um, when I started when I started doing patent research. I was more comfortable reading a physics paper than I was necessarily reading a patent. So my intent today is to share with you some of the things that I've learned about the, all the different types of patents and how that can be helpful uh, in the different kinds of research uh, that you might be interested in doing. So as Jim mentioned. I am going to be following an example in today's uh, presentation, not too closely. Uh, it's this 928 patent, the circuits patent that came up in a recent contest um, at Patexia. So if you do want to follow along in the PDF, that would probably be helpful just to get an idea of what the PDFs look like and what the different parts of it are. Uh, um, I will also be having some figures in my presentation, so it won't be too important um, if you don't have it. So with, the talk is going to start with a quick review. Uh, this is sort of a follow-up talk to a talk that Padram Samini, our CEO, gave a couple months ago about prior art and prior art search. So I'm going to go over some of the central concepts as they'll be useful to us. And then I'm going to dive right into um, the main body of my talk. And I'm going to talk about the different types of applications that there are uh, to file to the USBTO, and the different types of patents that there are, and then the, the different contents um, that you would expect to come across in those patents. So you can kind of get an, an idea of what to expect and where to look to sort of find um, the best information. So let's dive right in. Uh, a couple of months ago, Padram talked about prior art and prior art search, and it all starts with this idea of patentability, or who is entitled to a, pat uh, to, uh, a patent for their invention. And it comes back to this question of novelty, or is the idea new or not? So this is, this is central to our patent system. Um, the idea is that we only want to issue patent protection to people who have come up with something that is genuinely new, so genuine inventions. So the idea is uh, we want to figure out is the idea new or not. That's what the examiner is going to be looking at, and that's what um, everyone's going to look at when, it come, when a patent comes up in litigation as well. This is one of the central questions. And this leads us to prior art search. Um, and prior art search is the process of, of looking in all of the related documentation that was published before an application was filed. The idea being that we want to find whether or not that invention was described in all of that previous documentation. So that's and sort of the main motivation for prior art search, um, which is a big part of what we do here uh, at Patexia. So the kind of question that Pedram left from his presentation um, was where to look. So where do we go to find this sort of information? And uh, any, any published documentation that is dated, um, anything publicly available that is dated, uh, before the date, um, the priority date of the application, it qualifies as prior art. So we're not going to be focusing on a lot of the other types of prior art today, like all of the academic papers and whatnot. Uh, mostly we're going to be focusing on, on the intellectual property-based things, so patent applications, particularly with the USPTO um, and the records that they keep of patent applications and published patents. 
So let's start um, with the applications. Uh, applications, um, there's really one main type of application, what we call a standard non-provisional application. This is sort of what you would expect uh, for an inventor filing hoping to obtain patent protection with USPTO. It consists of three major parts, um, a specification, drawings, uh, and a set of claims that define the legal protection that, that that patent will eventually acquire if it does go through. I'll talk a little bit more about that at the end. Uh, this is the type of patent application that is examined by the USPTO and will eventually go on to become a patent um, as a patent prosecution or maybe become a different type of application, which we'll talk about in the, in the next slide. All of the standard non-provisional applications are published by the USPTO after 18 months um, as what we call PG pubs or pre-grant publications. Um, so before the application is even examined, uh, all of these non-provisional standard applications that are filed with USPTO are published and publicly available online. Um, so the, one of the main ways to access that is through the USPTO PAIR system. That stands for Patent Application Information Retrieval System. You can also search through these things once they're publicly available on um, uh, databases like the Google Patent Search, for example, is a, is a pretty good way of searching through the full text of these, these applications. Another type of application that is pretty common is uh, the provisional applications, and the provisional applications are uh, basically a, a quick and easy route to getting patent protection. Um, the, the main difference as far as inventors are usually concerned is that they're, they're significantly less expensive, and content-wise, they don't uh, contain any of the claims, um, so any of the specific legal statements that uh, the, the patent would eventually have protection for, that would eventually define the patent's um, scope of protection, as it were. They're also not examined by the USPTO, so provisional applications really only serve as a, a placeholder to get that earlier priority date, um, and they only apply for a 12-month period. So within that 12-month period, uh, the inventor would have to decide to either pursue the invention and, and turn that provisional into a non-provisional, a standard non-provisional application, um, or decide to abandon it and, and let, the, let the application go after 12 months. Provisional applications are not published, so the information in them uh, you're not going to be able to find or search through unless they eventually become a uh, standard non-provisional application. The next type of application I wanted to mention um, is that the PCT, or the Patent Cooperation Treaty uh, application, also known as international applications. And these are applications that are filed with the World Intellectual Property Organization, or WIPO. Um, the main goal being to, to sort of centralize and simplify the process of applying for patent protection in all of the different WIP countries. There's no such thing as an international patent. Um, so really the, the idea is just to, to formalize and standardize the patent application process. So the patent uh, applications actually have to go into a national phase and be prosecuted in each of the WIP member states that the inventor hopes to obtain patent protection for. Uh, the international applications can be really good source of information as well. Um, they're all searchable on the WIPO website. Uh, it's called Patent Scope, and you can look that up online. So once you've filed the initial application, there are a number of things that could happen um, in prosecution, and that's what, sort of what we'll talk about next. Um, there are a variety of objections or sort of determinations that the examiner could make that will, that will uh, force the inventor to make a decision about filing another application or not. So one of the things that could happen is that um, the initial specification that an inventor files could define uh, more than one invention as the examiner determines. And so because you can only have patent protection, like you can only get a patent, um, one a patent, one invention per application. So if the specification defines two different inventions, the inventor will need to decide which of those inventions he wants to pursue in the initial application. Um, and you can issue uh, what are called divisional applications to um, sort of divide up the patent and, and obtain patent protection for the remaining inventions that were in that initial disclosure. But again, you're not changing the initial specification for the initial disclosure. All you're doing is dividing up into uh, a couple other applications. The, the sort of more general continuation um, is the, the, the same thing as the initial specification um, from the original filing. Um, it doesn't claim any additional matter. Uh, the, the, it's, it's sort of a, to obtain a longer prosecution time in a lot of ways. Um, and one of the main ways that this is used is to um, claim additional matter if there's been sort of um, 
uh, more inventions disclosed in the initial specification than the inventor originally filed for. So they go through the specification again. They find that there are more things, that, more inventions that they would like to claim. They could file a continuation um, and add some claims to that with the initial specification. The sort of overarching thing that all these applications share is that they uh, all contain information or, or uh, disclosure, uh, disclosed matter that was contained in previous applications. So none of these are going to be a first filing. These are all going to originate um, from applications that have been filed and then entered into prosecution. Uh, the, the one exception to um, new matter is uh, what's called a continuation in part, and this is similar to a continuation in that the bulk of the specification for this type of application um, is the same as a previous application to USPTO, typically a, a previous non-provisional uh, non application. But there's also going to be a little bit of added matter, and typically this comes um, with incremental uh, invention improvement throughout the prosecution process, so uh, an inventor would file um, a continuation in part to add a couple extra features to their invention if, if they want to get um, more protection for, uh, for those features. The last type is a reissue patent, um, and this typically comes up only when there's been a problem uh, in a patent or a patent application, and it's basically surrendering a patent um, and restarting the application process to correct um, that mistake. So once the applications are filed um, and go through prosecution, we get into the different types of patents. And for all the all the types of patent applications that there are, there are really only three types of patents um, that you contain, and really only one that is um, sort of the most important and the most useful to us. And that's, that, those are the utility patents. The utility patents are what most people would think of when they think of a patent, um, which describes the sort of useful process machine and manufacturer composition of matter um, and the, the nature and the function of those things uh, to obtain patent protection. Um, the design patents are, are a little bit different. They uh, compose only about 8%. 10% or less usually of the patents that are filed or um, granted annually rather. And they are just about the, the external appearance and construction uh, of uh, a product, not anything related to the function. So the, the, the Apple rounded corners patent is a good example of this. Um, so something that is really just an aesthetic adjustment or an external design adjustment. Um, and the last type is the plant patents, 0.3%, typically less than about 1,000 applications granted per year. Um, and these are just for living organisms which express a set of uh, characteristics that are determined by its, um, its single genetic makeup, as it were. So mostly what we're concerned with um, in, in prior art search and in most types of, of patent research um, are the utility applications, just because they, they compose the bulk of the, um, the prior art that's out there in most cases as it relates to uh, the sort of stuff we're looking for. So that's really it for patent types um, So and application types. Uh, so let's dive a little bit into the contents of patents. And I talked this, uh, talked about this a little bit earlier. There are sort of three parts um, of a patent that are, are absolutely mandatory. Um, they're sort of general. The first one is the drawings. And if you take a look at our 928 example there, if you're following along with the PDF, uh, this is on pages two to five of the, the patent. The drawing is pretty straightforward. Um, a bunch of representative diagrams of all of the different aspects and all the different features of the, of the invention. Uh, the next part is the specification. The specification is going to be the bulk of the content in the patent, uh, written description of all the different aspects and all the different features that the, the, the patent relates to. And the last part that's going to be required in every patent, um, therefore every non-provisional patent application, uh, is going to be the claims. And the claims are the specific legal statement that define the scope um, of protection of the patent. So. If you do a lot of reading patents, um, so if you read a bunch of patents and if you take a, a close look at the, the patent that we pulled up as an example, sort of the first thing you'll notice is that there are lots of sections that are, are pretty standard or pretty common to um, patents that are, are, are more defined than just these three sections here. And the first place you sort of notice this is if you look right on the, the cover sheet, which I have pulled up now. You'll see there's a lot of information that is, is not, one of, just not just one of those three parts. And there's a lot of useful stuff on here. Uh, this, the, the cover pages for the patents are actually pretty well designed. It goes back to the days before there was a really good text search, full text search for the patents. And a uh, way to sort of get a good idea of a uh, patent that you, as you were flipping through a bunch of patents, was to have all the information right there on the cover page. So 
So that cover page is really designed to give you a really quick idea of what the patent is about. You'll see there's the patent title and the, the number there up in the corner um, and when the patent was issued, um, some stuff about inventors, and a representative drawing there at the bottom. I just want to point out sort of three sections that can be easily uh, overlooked and they're important here. If you look on the, the sort of the top left underneath the title, uh, there's a bunch of application information and priority information for the patent. And this can be really, really helpful in understanding what's the, the priority date or what's the earliest date that this, um, this patent claims this invention uh, for. Uh, so you see here you have the, the patent number when that patent, uh, or the, rather the patent application number and when that application was filed. And for this particular patent, there's also a related patent, a Taiwanese patent. You can see it was filed. Um, earlier in that year, and if there are any other uh, applications that are related continuations or previous non-original patents related to this patent, they'd be listed in this section as well. So that can be useful information to try to understand the relationship between this patent and um, applications that came before it. The next thing that you'll you'll note and find pretty important is the abstract, which is over there on the right hand side, and this is just a, a simple 100 to 200 word, uh, typically. Uh, explanation of, of what the patent's about generally, uh, designed to just give you a really quick overview about, about what it contains. And this is similar to the concept of an abstract in academic papers. It's designed to give you a complete overview without having to delve too far into things. And this is a really great way when you're, you're just looking at a patent, just like an academic paper, of, of getting an idea of what's going on before diving uh, into it in further depth. The last thing I want to point out are these classification codes, which you can find typically under the priority data um, over there on the left-hand side. And you see there's international classifications and U.S. classifications, and these are, are uh, indexed categories that um, both the WIPO and the US, uh, USPTO have designated for the various subject types. So if you look at the classification codes, this can be a really good way of, of giving you an idea of what the overarching subject um, categories are. So if you're looking to do some search, it's a, it's a good place to start um, to get an idea of what field the patent is in and what it relates to. And you'll see just below that there's this field of search um, section as well, and that lists all of the different categories that the examiner um, looked in when searching around for fire art or other related applications. Um, so that's about it for the cover page. The next thing that comes in the patent, uh, if you start flipping through it, is the drawings. We're mostly going to skip past the drawings. They're pretty self-explanatory. Um, good, good place to start when trying to figure out the invention. And definitely one of the first things that I look at are, are the drawings of, of, a, of a patent when I'm trying to understand what's going on in it. But then we get to the specification. Um, the specification is going to be, as I mentioned, the, the sort of bulk of the text of the patent, and it's going to really get into defining exactly what that, that patent is and what the features are. So uh, here I just want to outline the important section that I typically find helpful or go straight to when I'm, I'm reading the specification of the patent. Um, the first is the field of the invention. The field of the invention is typically pretty short and generally uh, is a, a broad outline of, of the subject matter that the patent relates to and what are some of the problems in that field or related to that subject that, that people have or people try to solve. The background of the invention is going to get a little bit more specific, so it's going to, it's going to cover the more closely related prior and explain what other inventions have come before that are similar, as well as sort of what uh, what 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 is problematic about that prior art, and so it's sort of defining the problems that this patent is going to solve with its invention. And then we get into the center of the invention next, and this is again going to be a quick summary, sort of like the abstract, but a little bit more detailed and a little bit more um, speaking to the problems that were defined in the background of the invention. So this is probably one of the best places to go to get a quick understanding of what other problems this patent solves and what differentiates it um, from the prior art. So if you look to the next page of the specification, there are uh, just a couple more sections here. Uh, the first one that I want to point out is the, the brief description of the drawings. Um, and you'll notice if you flip through the figures that there were no captions on the figures. Um, and so this is really just to give you an idea of what each figure is related to. So when you're flipping through the patent, this is a good section to uh, go straight to to get an understanding of, of those drawings and, and what each drawing represents in the patent. 
Um, as I mentioned, the drawings are a pretty good way of understanding what's going on. And then the rest of the patent is typically just description, a detailed description of the invention. Um, and this is where it gets into the specifics of the features, what the features of the patent are, and how they solve all of the problems um, that, that differentiate it from the prior art. The one thing I do want to point out uh, in the detailed description are these, uh, these little bolded numbers that you'll come across. Um, easy to overlook. What they are is a uh, number of references to um, the, the specific features that are listed within the figures of the patent. So um, if you were reading through and you see this number, you can easily flip back to the representative diagram of it in figures. Or if you're looking through in the figures and you see a feature that you want to read more about, it's pretty easy to just pick up that number and then um, flip, through to the, flip through the description, flip through the, the, the detailed description of the invention, and find the numbers um, to get a textual description of, of the features that you're looking for. So if we keep going through the patent, the last page that we see is going to be the claims. Um, and the claims are uh, the specific, as I mentioned before, the specific legal statements that are going to afford the patent um, protection. So they will define the scope of protection of the patent. Um, and I don't want to go too in-depth into the claims and claim construction here. Uh, but if you're on, uh, if you're if you're doing prior art search, and this is your sort of your subject patent, um, these really are going to define the, the the limitations that you're going to be out there looking for. Um, it's easy to overlook these when actually looking through prior art, though, as well. Um, so if I'm I'm looking in a patent for these specific statements from another patent, it can be a really good place to to find some language that describes uh, features in prior art as well. So. Uh, that's about it. I think I've covered the, the basics of patents and patent types and patent application types um, and hopefully given you some information about navigating around patents that will be pretty helpful. Uh, I know some of this stuff and understanding this, some of this stuff has been really helpful to me in, in getting all this down. So I hope that was a, helpful to everybody. Thank you all for listening and I think um, we're going to take a couple questions now if we have some time. Yeah, so uh, thanks again everybody. Uh, we are going to take some just just we'll just do one question because we went a little bit long, um, and that quite. Oh. Sorry, my audio was, was muted. Um, so yeah, we're we're just going to do one question because we went a little bit long, um, and that's going to be from Scott at home. Uh, and the question is: I heard that the new U.S. patent law ignored any date except the patent file date. Is this true? Um. That's a good question, Scott, and I, I don't think I'm going to have quite uh, the time. I think we're a little pressed for time here to uh, answer that question as fully as I would like. Um, the short answer is is that that, that date is very important. Uh, the, the sort of first person to be able to come in and file an invention, uh, file uh, file a patent for an invention, is pretty critical. Um, but if it comes up in in the in um, like in interference proceeding, there still is a. a an organization at the USPTO that um, will help determine, um, like, resolve patent disputes if that, if that comes up. So. Okay. All right. So that's uh, that's everything. Um, uh, thanks again uh, for coming. And thanks very much, Daniel, for for speaking. Um, the recording and the slides will be available shortly. I've been set up in my now. Um, our next webinar is going to take place on June 13th with Peter Kim, uh, who will cover patent monetization strategies. Um, you can, again, you can see the full list of the past and upcoming webinars on the Catexia IP Matters page. Um, and if you have any suggestions for future webinars, you can email them to webinar at Um Maybe it's, it's webinars. But thanks, every, uh, thanks again, everybody, for coming. Um, and uh, hopefully we'll see you.